Hello, I'm Russell Redman, Senior Editor at Supermarket News. And as part of SN's annual Financial Analyst Roundtable, we hold video chats with some of the panelists to get more of their thoughts on what's ahead for the grocery industry. With us today is Scott Mushkin, founder and CEO of R5 Capital. Welcome, Scott. Thanks for having me. Well, there's certainly a lot of economic noise uh, going on uh, around the industry right now. Um, which of the companies do you think will be the biggest winners as 2021 winds down and we head into 2022? So it's a, it's a great question. And we were, you know, with all hold reporting out and it, Probably the timing of this video is, is probably later as you release it, but I'll hold happy to report overnight um, before this mm -hmm. video. Uh, very strong results. And, and I think the, the issue is, if you think about Wall Street, um, we've all been kind of wedded to the idea that traditional supermarket business is you know, failing. Um, it's on decline. And that's the way it's been for almost 20 years. You know, Kroger had kind of a rebirth for, for a bit. What's interesting now, though, is if you look at these three companies, the big three, uh, I'll hold Albertsons and Kroger, we're, we believe, and this is a very different view than we had three or four years ago, but we believe we're exiting the pandemic in much better shape than we went into it. And sometimes, like in, in Wall Street, we get stuck so much in the weeds, we don't back up and say, okay, from 30,000 feet, you know, what does this industry look like? And so that's what we were doing this morning. And it was a fascinating exercise. So if you look at food at home, food spending in 2019, it's about $1.8 billion. 55% went to food away from home, 45% went to food at home. We also got the inflation numbers out this morning, which were very strong. I think food at home was up almost 6%. So if we, start from 2019, bring forward food at home, which was about 820 billion, to 2022, running a, uh, an inflation rate, let's say a compounded rate of four and a half percent, which I think is probably standard, you get industry revenues of like over $900 billion. Um, so that's one way to look at it. You can go from 2020 and say, okay, we had 1.69 billion, but almost almost $900 billion of food at home spending. So there's so many different ways you can run it from a 30,000 foot level and say, okay, what are we gonna get for food at home spending in 2022? And almost every number that I can come up with is somewhere between 900, very on the low side, I think that's low, to over a trillion dollars. And so then if you look at, you know, how much, you know, the market share of Albertson to Kroger or Ahol, and what, you, what, what starts to come through is that people are too bearish on this industry, that there is going to be more revenues than I think a lot of people believe, even once we, quote unquote, exit the pandemic. Um, so, you know, I, this, from a macro perspective, as we think about 2022 um, and 2023 going forward, Inflation kind of changes everything a little bit when you're compounding at four or five percent right. or you know, four percent. It just it really kind of changes the discussion. And oh, by the way, there's probably extra meals. So we got a population that grows about 50 basis points. We are going to exit the, the pandemic or become, you know, just deal with it. You know, we just deal with COVID. We're likely to have more meal at home occasions. Plus, you get the inflation rate built in. And so I think people have to rejigger their idea about the traditional supermarket space. And certainly we have um, a lot, uh, even more so this morning as I was running through those big macro numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you mentioned that you think that the industry is coming out of the pandemic stronger than it went in. Uh, what, what do you think is the biggest change or some of the biggest changes that companies have made? I mean, anytime you get a windfall of money that, that creates, you know, look at Albertsons, which is our top pick. You know, Albertsons went into the pandemic levered up, um, probably needing to put some more CapEx to work. Um, you know, they, the other thing that's happened with Albertsons is the, uh, the Rescue Act is going to improve their pensions quite a bit. So you look at this company 18 months later, it's just like, it's like night and day. And then you look at the valuation, it's still, even though it's doubled this year, the valuation is, you know, it's trading at I don't know, five and a half times EBITDA. Um, and so 
it, it just creates so you can invest behind your business, um, you know, through your assets. So it becomes somewhat of a, you know, good cycle to be on. Um, you know, even Kroger, which we're less high on, like they have money to invest. I'll hold has money to invest. I'll hold just opened up again. We're going to time, but yesterday or a couple of days ago, it's as far as news, the facility down in Philadelphia, right. the fulfillment facility. Well, they had the money to do it and still put up great numbers. And so, you know, you know, money is good uh, if you're running a business and windfalls are great. And the smart management teams, and I'd say, you know, all these management teams are putting it to work. Um, we think the best management team in the, in the business is why our top pick is Albertsons. Um, but all the companies are making, I would say, moves to get their businesses in, on better, better footing. <laughs> the, the, the other thing I would add, um, and this came up uh, when I was talking to Albertsons uh, post their quarter, the unionized workforce. Now, we'll have to watch this a little bit to see right. like what the demands are. But the, in, in, we've seen deer go on strikes. So we've seen some unions walk mm -hmm. out. One of the things that's fascinating though, is it's putting them on a much more level playing field. And what I mean by that is that Walmart, Dollar General, Amazon, they have to keep up. And so it used to be a, you know, a, a negative to have a union mm -hmm. and you can still walk into that strike. So that's, that's definitely it. But if you're going to look at like the difference between what you have to pay someone in, you know, in a unionized situation versus everybody else, that everybody else is catching up real darn quick. So again, we're exiting the pandemic with a much more even playing field from labor. Now labor's in an incredibly short supply, but it, right. it's just even things out quite a bit between the non-union and the union guys. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned uh, e-commerce before, and, and one of the headlines in that is um, what's going on with Kroger, its efforts to open the, the online fulfillment centers mm -hmm. uh, with Ocado and markets where it lacks stores. Um, what kind of prospects do you see for that business model? Is that a way for them maybe to drive their own brand's portfolio, our brand's, whatever, whatever they call it? <laughs> so, so it's interesting. We have companies going different directions right now. I can't talk about the big three, but we can go even broader than that. Um, Albertsons is kind of going in a more asset light, you know, uh, fast follower. Like we don't necessarily want to be leading things. Kroger obviously went full out into Ocado, big partnership. And then they're also, you know, filling in with some micro and smaller fulfillment. Um, and we had a whole buy fresh direct. They just opened that facility, I think it's 124,000 square feet. So a moderate yep. facility down in, in Pennsylvania. Um, so they're obviously being some central fill capabilities to a whole, but also doing the micro fulfillment. I think as we look at it, so a couple of things, uh, which I think are interesting. We just did a focus group in Chicago. And one of the things that come out of the pandemic is that if you 18 months ago, everybody wanted everything delivered to the home, period. 18 months forward, given all the pickup and everything that's gone on, and the idea that a lot of people have test driven the grocery options, the pickup at store, and this is the part that surprised me, but it's one of the biggest changes happened, is the pickup at store for the full grocery shop has shot way above the delivery to home. Um, is what the consumer wants. Um, so that is an enormous change. And so if you think about Albertsons in this, in, in this thought, or you think about all, all you think about Kroger, the one thing that makes us a little bit nervous about Kroger is they went Ocado heavy. Big centralized facilities, they opened up one in Florida, and then right. they have satellites that they're, that they're putting in place. They're going to drop another one right into kind of where Ahold's territory is with yeah. Fresh Direct. And so I really, like it may work. They're a smart team. Like they've thought a lot of things through. Like it's a capital intensive, this is Kroger. It is a capital right. intensive um, bet on more delivery. And now they're going to try to do, um, you know, bring it into stores so they'll fill it centrally and you'll pick it up at the store. You know, there may, the partnership with Walgreens, they may install, you know, stuff there. But if you look at Florida, and I think it's good, they don't have stores. So they've dropped this in. They're very pleased with the revenue. 
But that doesn't tell me too much. The question is, what is the profitability of this going to look like three, mm -hmm. five years from now? Yep. And so if you think that they're going to, um, they have to share some profits with Ocado. If they decide to go, because of what I said about people wanting to pick up at store, not necessarily deliver to the home, if they decide to like expand their partnership with Walgreens, which is possible, all of a sudden they're splitting any profits made on those types of omni-channel purchases between three different companies, themselves, Ocado, and Walgreens. So we don't love it. Like I got just flat out, like I've talked to them, like they know how I feel. Like I, I, I worry about this strategy, the split of profits, kind of where the consumer seems to be going. If it were me, um, I would, I think the idea of what Giant is doing down in the Philadelphia market, mm -hmm. where you have a true omni-channel presence, where you have stores for people to pick up, you have a, some central filling capacities, um, that makes a lot of sense to me, given our consumer research. Um, it makes a lot less sense from where we stand now from our consumer research to drop standalone facilities into markets without a store base. Um, and that would suggest maybe Kroger, if they end up agreeing with me, we'll get back in the M&A market and say, hey, listen, we do need some physical assets in some of these areas. No, they have Harris Teeter's kind of coming up into the well, it's not as high, it's not as far as New York and Connecticut. Like that, that idea that they're going to drop, drop a big Ocado facility into this, uh, I mean, Connecticut, that's where our five is out of. Um, I, I don't get it. I, I really yeah. just don't. Um, and it's, it's probably our number one reason that we're a little bit more cautious on Kroger versus, um, you know, certainly versus Albertsons, but even versus is Ahold, just that this omni channel strategy that they're pursuing. Mm -hmm seems like it does have more risk. Um, and, it, you know, inflation can bail them out to a degree, but it does seem to have a little bit more risk associated with it. Yeah, I think everyone's curious to see what eventually happens there. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the mass merchants, you know, Walmart and Target, have aggressively expanded their online services and fulfillment capabilities and infrastructure. Right. And they seem to get the biggest benefit from e-commerce since the onset of the pandemic. Um, why is that? And do you think traditional supermarkets are losing grocery, online grocery share to them? That's a great question. I mean, the, the winners through the pandemic on a share basis have actually been these traditional grocers. We're again looking at this morning, Albertson stack comp is, is the highest. Um, uh, Ahold's right there. Neck, they're kind of neck and neck. Kroger's a step below, but generally they've gained share over the, the two year period. Um, Walmart you know, obviously 25% of the market, they lost some share, um, which they're now kind of recouping. The, and we did, we've done a lot of research on Walmart. Walmart, um, when Greg Ferran left management, they had a massive amount of management turnover. They decided to kind yeah. of change the way their stores, the labor model at their stores at the, at the beginning of, right at the end of last year, the beginning of this year. Um, that created an enormous amount of uh, disruption. That's probably a nice way to say it. Their stores were a mess at the beginning of 2021. And we documented that really a lot in our research. But they did with the previous administration, Greg Frana's team, they rolled out a lot of click and collect. Um, it's really inefficient, not just for Walmart, but particularly for Walmart. We timed them. R5 is both a research and a consulting firm. So we follow those pickers around and time them and um, it takes them a long time to pick. So fast forward though to today, money's a great elixir in retail. If you got money, you can spend it. Walmart's, you know, never count a Walmart down. There's you know, like a lot of smart people there. So if we fast forward to 2021, what was our number one sell recommendation at the beginning of 21 is flip to a buy. So why? They've settled down the stores. They are continuously getting better and better at the picking. We know people want to go to the stores, you know, to maybe the, you know, the pickup. Um, again, coming off this focus group where a lot of the women worked, it's very convenient for them to drive by Walmart or Kroger. Um, and they're now accelerating automation. 
Again, money's great. And so they're going to have the money. And so I would look at Walmart as, you know, an incredibly formidable operator coming out of, you know, this, this period, especially if the economy gets a little dicey here with the inflation running so high. So right now we are the most constructive on Albertsons and Walmart. Um, different reasons, but we think that those companies are in, in brief, we want to overweight the sector. I can't believe I'm saying this. We want to overweight the sector. Um, and the, the two companies we really want to own are Walmart and, Tar uh, sorry, Walmart and, uh, and Albertsons. And so it would maybe without, I mean, Costco is not really a grocer, but Costco is pretty darn good company too. So. <laughs> Um, again, in the e-commerce uh, arena, um, Instacart has expanded its role as an enabler to supermarket chains and other grocery retailers with their uh, expanded coverage for delivery and pickup, new services. They're in alcohol delivery. Um, they even are building a micro-fulfillment solution with, uh, I think it's Fabric. And um, now they have this convenience hub for 30-minute deliveries of small order type of items and some mm -hmm. other services. Um, do retailers still see Instacart as a potential competitor? Because that, that's something I hear all the time. Or, or might in Instacart actually be maybe the key ally that uh, brick and mortar grocers need to kind of fend off Amazon? Yeah, so it's kind of like a frenemy. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, obviously the grocers are, are using them, but at the same time with what you, you know, their micro fulfillment, but you're bringing up, so, so the answer is, yes, they're a competitor. A fren frenemy is probably the best way to say it. But I think I would even step back further. We're talking about Instacart, but I'd even, so what are the biggest risks to this more bullish outlook I talked about for the industry? And it, and it goes to what Kroger's doing, dropping a facility into the Northeast. Um, and the stickiness of these omnichannel customers, which tend to be pretty sticky. And we've not talked about, so we talked about Instacart, we haven't talked about Amazon, which probably needs to be talked about. So the the idea here is, do we get some kind of, you know, war, omni-channel war breaking right. out? And, and to me, this is by far the biggest risk. So Kroger's going to drop a facility here. Like, well, how are they going to get to customers? Well, they're going to tell us we're going to get $25 off our first three orders. Well, certainly Apple doesn't want to bring those give those customers up. So Avo wants to retain them. And it's very reminiscent of other industries that have gone through this, whether it be the banking industry back in the 80s and early 90s, where they were giving everything away free. I'm, I'm aging myself here. So hopefully some of the people that are on here know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, or, the, or the cellular industry. You know, like right. we see this happen where to attract and pull people away because of the stickiness. And so that's our biggest concern. And to the extent that, uh, you know, Instacart is going to build facilities and try to attract people and has the funding to do it, that would be a negative. Um, but to me, and you didn't ask this question, but I'm going to, uh, but I'm going to ask it of myself, is how about the guy in Seattle? What the heck do they do? You know, we've got a record saying their stores stink and they really, they're really not good. Um, but at its core, Amazon is a logistics and distribution company. Right. They're putting an enormous amount of assets into the ground, distribution assets and fulfillment assets. Yeah, I think you previously mm -hmm. said something like tens of billions of dollars they've been spending. Oh, I mean, it's over $70 billion will be spent on CapEx this year. <laughs> um, and to kind of put that in perspective, I think the Pentagon budget is like 700 billion, 750 billion. So it's like one tenth of the Pentagon budget <laughs> one year. Um, over a multi-year period, I think it approaches uh, the three-year period, it's like 250 billion. Or, I mean, the, not, the numbers are just like, like, how could this be? So there's two things. They're in 15 cities already with five hours or less with about 3 million items, number one. And their idea to do that is if you press down delivery times, consumers will be like, yeah, do I need to go to the store? Maybe not. And one of their biggest growth areas is obviously consumables. So this is actually really important. I try to articulate this. I was actually at CNBC trying to try to say the same thing. And we'll give it a shot again. Is that we think about a grocery shop as 
a full shop. In other words, like, you know, I think the average spend is like 30 or $40, but we do do the stock up trip. And even when we're going just for the fill-ins, we're usually buying a basket of goods. Yes. Okay. Amazon is almost like making us think about instead of that shop, what do I need right now? And do I need, again, I'm old. This is like, this is like the uh, cookie pen or whatever it's called. <laughs> I had to take to go with my, my cholesterol medicine. So like, this is supposed to be good for you. So like, if I need that, do I go to Walgreens or Kroger? Who do I go? Or if Amazon can get it to me in five hours or less, do I just, so that's their big play is driving down delivery times. And of course you have these ultra fast guys that are popping up and well-founded, funded, but they're very limited skew. And then of course, Amazon can always do that anyway, because they have more money than God. Um, so, so that's important. The second thing that's important and scary, so we talk about risks, so we talked about the omni-channel like arms race and war. The second biggest risk I see is the idea that Amazon's built all this infrastructure. They have very, very high fixed costs. The only way to really make this work is through volume. They need the volumes over, you think about the, the air hub in Cincinnati or the you know, 85 uh, planes going to 150 planes, the 10,000 vehicles, 100,000 uh, electric trucks. That, so the, they, they're having an enormous embedded infrastructure. The only way to make that work is if you have lots of volume. And so the scariest thing about Amazon is not their stores, which stink. It's not the Amazon fresh, the full grocery delivery. It's them pushing price to fill up a distribution network because they got to run them as efficiently as possible. And to that end, they're really starting right now into next year, investing significantly in robotics to get the efficiencies of these, get some of the labor out, get the efficiencies up. So don't forget about our friends in Seattle. It's definitely a threat to the industry as is that kind of uh, war that could break out with on the show. So you asked about Instacart and you got a lot more than that. <laughs> okay, well, uh, that's all the questions that we have for today. Thanks a lot, Scott, for uh, joining us. Always a pleasure. And uh, thanks everyone out there for uh, watching us. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it.